Your friend has just beaten you in a nail-biting, no-items Omega fight in Super Smash Bros. Wii U. Your friendship now destroyed, thinking he cheated, you challenge him to a duel in real life. If you live in America, this could actually be legal. Hi, I'm Dylan, and you guys asked for it, so here it is, Trial by Combat. If you haven't seen the Trial by Combat stuff in Season 4 of Game of Thrones, go watch that and then come back. Popularized by Tyrion's Trials by Combat in Game of Thrones, a judicial duel, or a wager battle, was very much a thing for a very long time, and weirdly enough, is still a thing. But more on that in a minute. While primarily practiced by Germanic peoples in Europe, trials by combat happen in some form or another all around the world. It's hard to know exactly when the first trial by combat was, but England introduced the wager battle into common law in the 11th century. Usually used in murder trials, but also in some other cases, the trial by combat was a tool used by the judicial system to determine if God knew of your innocence. The idea being that an accused would not die in combat if God knew of his or her innocence. Like in Game of Thrones, defendants and accused users would be able to appoint champions to fight on their behalf. With certain people, namely the unfortunately named Richard Swinefield, the Bishop of Hereford, keeping champions on a yearly retainer. The battles would take place in a 60 square foot area, last from noon till sunset, and the specific combat rules would vary from country to country. The whole process was sort of just an evolution of the trial by ordeal. Trials by ordeal are an ancient judicial practice in which the innocence or guilt of an accused are determined by the outcome of a horrific physical ordeal. Again, and the idea being that God wouldn't let an innocent die. For example, they would force people to plunge their arms into a boiling pot of water or oil to retrieve a rock or a ring. And in three days, if their arm was healing correctly, they would be determined innocent, if not guilty. There were ordeals of fire in which the accused would have to walk across burning hot strips of metal. And there were ordeals of cold water in which the accused would have rocks tied to their neck and then be thrown in a river. If they sank, they were guilty. If they floated, they were innocent. The concept of the trial by combat has roots in the Scandinavian tradition of home gang. Basically, anyone could challenge anyone else to a duel over property ownership or honor or really any other sort of disagreement. The challengee would have to show up to the duel or risk being outcast due to their supposed lack of honor. By the early 13th century, trial by ordeal gave way to trial by jury, which led to the emergence of the legal profession. These newly formed lawyers would advise their clients to avoid trial by combat like it was death because it was death. This led to the modern concept of attorneys representing defendants. But the trials wouldn't always be between two people. In 1396, one of the last mass combat trials took place in Scotland. Known as the Battle of the Clans, the event took place between two opposing teams of around 30 people each. They were fighting over the right to hold the right flank in an upcoming massive battle. So they had a battle for the battle, in which only 12 of the original 60 participants survived. The last official English trial by combat is thought to have taken place in 1638, but there's some evidence that the king had intervened, so it's hard to know. After that, trial by combat largely fell into disuse, until 1818 when Abraham Thornton was accused of rape and murder. He demanded a trial by combat, was granted his request, and then set free when his accuser didn't show up to battle. British Parliament would later abolish trial by combat a year later in 1819. Oh, and just so you know, if one party doesn't show up to battle, you are granted two slices and two stabs into the air, upon which you are granted victory. Seriously. While trial by combat died among commoners, a similar practice would soon become very popular with royals and aristocrats. Having evolved from officially sanctioned trials by combat and finding roots in the Scandinavian tradition of home gang, similar to the dueling in Bravos, the gentleman's duel would become a very common way to resolve disputes of honor, among other things. To instigate a duel, the offended would demand satisfaction, often by throwing a glove down before the one who offended them. This is where the expression throwing down the gauntlet comes from. This dated back to the times of chivalry and knights. When being knighted, after being tapped on the shoulder three times with a sword, they would often be slapped across the face with a gauntlet, this representing symbolically the last act they could not redress. Then becoming tradition, anyone slapped with a glove could accept the challenge to correct the wrong or be dishonored. And while commoners didn't partake, dueling had a huge impact. During the reign of King Henry IV, over 4,000 Frenchmen were killed during duels. And while in most 
places dueling was seen as super illegal, the justice system was typically very relaxed about it, and winners of duels were seen as heroes, not as murderers. Duels became especially popular among military officials in America. And in the late 18th century, the United States lost two-thirds as many men to dueling as it did to naval combat. The first Secretary of the Treasury in the United States, Alexander Hamilton, was challenged to a duel by Aaron Burr, the third Vice President of the United States. The duel was a result of Burr being offended by some comments Hamilton had made, so they decided to have a fight to the death. While most duels were fought in secluded areas with rapiers or fancy dueling pistols, some duels got a bit more exciting. 1808 reportedly saw a duel between two Frenchmen flying over Paris in hot air balloons, shooting pistols at each other's balloons attempting to puncture them. The Enlightenment in the late 18th century would lead to the depopularization of dueling, but it would never fully kill it. In Russia, the dueling code was published as late as 1908, and weirdly enough, dueling was most common among writers and poets. Poet Alexander Pushkin, for example, fought in 29 duels. Peru still has duels, often also by politicians. 1957 would see soon-to-be Peruvian Prime Minister Fernando Bolande Turi, sorry about that pronunciation, duel a congressman who had insulted him. In 2002, Peruvian Congressman Etal Ramos would challenge the Peruvian Vice President to a duel with pistols. Again, over an argument, but the Vice President declined. In Japan in 2005, 12 teenagers would pair off to duel in a park over some trouble regarding the sale of a motorcycle. They established rules similar to the old formal dueling rules in Europe, but were arrested before things could go too far. In 2002, trial by combat was brought to the surface again by a British man by the name of Leon Humphreys. He was fined £25 for failing to notify the transit authorities that he had removed his motorcycle from road usage. Perhaps inspired by the recent release of A Storm of Swords, he refused to pay and claimed that he had the right under medieval law to a trial by combat with a champion appointed by the driver and vehicle licensing agency. Unfortunately, the court Court denied his request and increased his fine. But the interesting thing is, trial by combat is still legal in America. Since they broke off from the UK before trial by combat was made illegal, it was never taken out of American common law. Many will make the argument that the Founding Fathers didn't have trials by combat and thus didn't want their descendants to. But they did have duels, meaning they weren't above solving problems through combat. While it's unlikely that we'd ever actually see a trial by combat in America, it's still technically legal. So next time you're charged with doing everyone in the world a favor by poisoning literally the worst child that has ever existed, maybe go with the mountain, not the viper. What do you guys think? Would our justice system be way better or at least way more badass if it was combat based? Let me know in the comments and if you want to learn more about anything I talked about in this episode, there's links in the description. If you haven't already, be sure to click right on my face to subscribe or at least think about it.